Well, let me tell you something, brother. Snort, snort, snort. Tell you, drip, snort, snort. I got the drip. Go. Okay, so let's talk about skull and bones. I agree, DSP. Let's talk about skull and bones. And for context, I did kind of cut the front of this clip off because he was going on and on about how Cat was looking for a game to play, and he gave her all sorts of recommendations, and she wound up wanting to play Skull and Bones. And then he went out of his way to make sure that he told us that they didn't actually wind up paying for the game, and that they instead used the You Play subscription service, whatever it's called. Because of course he went out of his way to tell us that. Because anytime he talks about them spending money, or I guess in this case not spending money, he feels the need to reassure his audience that it was super cheap and he wouldn't usually do this but it was such a good deal you guys the only streamer that i'm aware of that has to justify all of their purchases including the ones not for the stream to their audience we played it for two hours and here was our experience okay when you first boot up skull and bones you're essentially on a ship that immediately gets destroyed and so you're with like this skeleton crew it's like you and two other people on like a skiff a tiny little boat that's just going around and your job is essentially to survive so you're like you know, sailing around fighting sharks with, like, spears. And you basically have to gather a few resources, do, like, mini missions, and then get to the first town, which is called St. Anne, all right? So at first, it's kind of interesting because you're learning the controls. It's a little different than, you know, when you're on the skiff, it's different than when you played Assassin's Creed. And the graphics, I'll be honest, they're not terrible, but they're also not good. Like, the water effects are hilarious. It looks like fuzz. It looks like fuzz is coming on your bows. Like, is that supposed to be water or... Are you, like, in the field of pollen in the middle of spring? Like, what is this? The effects are bizarre. I think they use their own graphics engine called Anvil. And honestly, it doesn't look that good. I was like, why did they go with that? They could have easily gone with something else. It was just weird to me. I was scratching my head, like, why did they go with that? And we were off to such a good start. He was telling us about how the game started. He was telling us about how he was learning the controls, how it doesn't control the same as Assassin's Creed, which of course it does, and it's been years. But of course, it's DSP that we're talking about. So of course, we managed to find a way to talk about the graphics. The aspect of a game that, if you ask me, is one of the least important to the actual game itself. Because I don't think that the graphics of a game actually matter almost at all. Because as long as you enjoy playing a game, the actual gameplay aspect of it and enjoy engaging with the game's mechanics, the graphics shouldn't really be all that important. That's why a lot of my favorite games aren't graphically impressive at all. Games like Kenshi, Project Zomboid, RimWorld. On the surface, these graphics, they don't look good, but when you dive under the hood and actually look at the mechanics of the game, that's what's important and those are fun to engage with. But DSP is such a graphics whore. Every time he talks about a new game, before he can talk about any of the mechanics, he has to tell you what the game looks like. The other day, we were talking about stuff Blade, and I said that the first thing that people comment on is the graphics because they don't actually have a chance to play the game yet, so all they really can talk about is how it looks, how the character looks, how the world looks. But that isn't the case for DSP. He finds himself in the perfect opportunity to be the guy to tell everybody how the game's mechanics work together. He played it one day before it came out, and he has the opportunity to tell everybody his first impression of the actual gameplay. But instead, he wants to start off his impressions with talking about the graphics, that thing that anybody could look up online and instantly see. And honestly, I have to give a big ups to anybody who's willing to make their own game engine for their game. I don't imagine that that's something that's exactly easy to do and it requires a lot of time and patience. Both things I know nothing about. Um, so once you arrive at St. Anne, all the story begins. <laughs> I said the story begins because basically this is where the game guides you. But what you quickly start to understand about Skull and Bones is that there is no story. Skull and Bones is the story of you being a pirate, and that's it. And what I mean by that is, what does a pirate do? Uh, well, you probably need a ship. You probably need to arm that ship with, like, weapons. You probably need to eventually recruit more crew members. You need to go out and sail, and you're probably going to be fighting other ships and pillaging and, and plundering certain areas and things like that. Yes, that's the game. No, but that's the whole game. Like, there's no actual narrative to it. It's just you just play it for the sake of playing it.
At the end of the day, that's why you play every game, DSP. You play the game to play it, no? I get what you're saying, but the way you're saying it is just stupid. Also, yes, it's a pirate game. That sounds exactly how a pirate game should play, if you ask me. There doesn't have to be a narrative as long as there is things to do. If there's treasure to go find, if there's ships to engage in combat with, if there's islands to explore, if there's weapons and ships to unlock, if there's crew customization, the narrative is going to come last for me. Project Zomboid does not have a narrative. It is not story driven at all. It's a zombie game. What do you do in a zombie game? Well, you fight zombies and you survive. That's literally the whole game, dude. But it's a fantastic game nonetheless. There's no story involved. And that's what I mean when you think about, oh, well, Assassin's Creed 4, Edward Kenway. He was one of the best protagonists in Assassin's Creed history. He was super unique. His story was great. There was great supporting characters. There's none of that in Skull and Bones. There's no narrative. You're just going to a town and talking to NPCs. They're giving you missions, which are essentially go out there and sack ships, gather resources, craft things, improve your ship and crew, and then go out there and do it again. That's, that's the game. That's the entirety of the game. Okay. That does sound a little basic, but it sounds like an engaging gameplay loop regardless. I guess it would really come down to how engaging those missions are, the variety of missions, and exactly how in-depth the customization for your crew, ship, and weapons are. I mean, when it comes to a pirate game, what more could you really ask for? Pirating is all about looting, plundering, and sailing a ship. And scurvy, I guess. <clears throat> now, if you're okay with that, then good for you. If you like that, if that gameplay loop sounds exciting to you, then maybe this is the game for you. But if you were looking for any kind of a, a meaningful story, there's zero. They didn't even write one. They didn't even bother with that, okay? If you've ever heard of, like, the term games as a service, I think this is, like, the, ex the poster child textbook example of what that will become if games as a service just becomes the standard in the industry. There's no point to playing Skull and Bones besides wasting your time, but if you enjoy your time that you're wasting, then I guess it's okay, why was there a question mark at the end of that? Yes, DSP, if you enjoy wasting the time however you're wasting it, it's not wasted time. Games are meant to be enjoyed. They're meant to be played for fun. I know that that's not your experience because for some reason you decided to turn your hobby into a job and now you can't stand doing it. But most other people play games to have fun, to relax, to unwind from an actual job that they have to do every day. He's just so detached from the average gamer. He thinks that he's one of them. He thinks that he speaks for the common man when it comes to video games and the video game industry one of the notable things about skull and bones is immediately when you start playing even before you get to the first town of saint anne it's co-op you can immediately team up with people online and uh yeah like basically uh it, it immediately throws you into this online world the funny part about it is you don't even understand what it means it's like oh so and so's you know wants to join a party. do you just say yes do you say no I don't know. What does it entail? So you're like, okay, let's join the party. So you say, join party. Wait, what? Why would you just accept to join the party if you don't know what it's going to do, DSP, if you don't know the ramifications of that action? It's already strange enough that either you or Kat decided to go online with Skull and Bones to begin with, but then you actually accepted it. Not only considered it, but actually went out of your way to do it. This whole story is just bizarre, especially because they didn't know what was even going to happen. What if it took them out of their world and reset all of their progress to go to somebody else? Else's world who might have been somewhere else in the game. I doubt that that was ever even going to be an option, really. But they didn't know, and they didn't even bother looking into it before they just started hitting the accept button. The two most socially isolated hermits in Renton, Washington, decided to take this leap of faith with Skull and Bones online all of a sudden. And then what happens is everyone's still playing the game separate. Like, you still have to play it separately. It reminds me of, like, World of Warcraft, where you're in a party, but everyone's doing different things. But if you're in the same mission, what you all have to do is go talk to the same NPC to advance the story. Story. There's no story. But advance the mission to go to the next part. So, for example, we're in the tutorial area, sailing around. We join a, join a group just to see what it does. It doesn't seem to do anything. Um, and then we talk to the NPC, which advances the, the mission. Okay, let's go to the next mission. Oh, you can't because the other person in your group didn't talk to the NPC yet. Huh? So now I gotta fucking go pull this this fucking no load and get them to, to play the game. What are they doing? Scratching their ass, sailing around fucking who knows what they're doing, right? So I gotta wait for them. So unless you're gonna team up 
with people you know and you're going to voice communicate and coordinate, don't go into multiplayer with randoms. It immediately is a hassle in this game. There's no fucking point to doing it. It was probably designed with that in mind, DSP. It's kind of strange to me that you even bothered trying to play with a random to begin with. Me personally, I don't ever try and play with randoms. Aside from FPS games where you join full servers, I'm not going out of my way to play with randoms ever. But it sounds like this game intended for you to go into multiplayer and actually work together and communicate and be around the other people in the game. I don't know, just sounds like it to me. But that doesn't exactly sound like the most ludicrous idea to me. Sometimes, just sometimes, I think that he likes to complain just to complain. I know, that might sound crazy, but just sometimes, man. Okay. So, anyway, some hilarious moments of us playing Skull and Bones. Hilarious moment number one. Cat is sailing around in the skiff, all right, and she needs to gather resources to build her first ship. As she does it, first of all, we quickly realize there's no actual, like, action in the game. It's all quick time events. So you go to harvest wood. All of a sudden, a giant saw appears on the screen with a meter, yellow, green, and red. And you have to press the button when it's in the green to harvest maximum wood. And I'm thinking to myself, this looks familiar somehow. I got to put my finger on it. Okay? So then, oh, we got to harvest coconuts. Well, you have a sickle, and it shows a sickle attacking a tree, and you have to press the button when it's in the green, or else you don't harvest as many coconuts, or you fail and you don't get the coconuts. Okay? So you never get off the boat. You never actually do these things. They're all quick time events. Okay? It is a Ubisoft game at the end of the day, isn't it? So are we really surprised that they've supplemented any sort of gameplay by just doing QTEs? But that's not necessarily a deal breaker for me either. Because I often find in games that I enjoy that some features are lacking, but they make up for it in other places. So while there may be QTEs to gather resources, maybe there's some robust economy style trading system going on behind the scenes at all times, where the prices are constantly fluctuating and you could become a pirate that has to transport his goods from one island to another where the prices are different. I'm not saying that this is the case. In fact, it probably isn't because again, it's a Ubisoft game and that would actually be cool and interesting. But the way that DSP critiques a game always comes off as more irritating than informative. I don't know if it's due to the lack of detail or because he just moves on so flippantly in between subjects because he doesn't actually bother thinking about how he's going to talk about the game before he talks about it. But it's definitely something and I just can't put my finger on it. If you know, please let me know. I'm trying to find out why he's so irritating so we're, we're doing all this harvesting gathering and then all of a sudden the game freezes we're like, oh no the game froze did it save anything it freezes i'm not kidding you for about 15 to 20 seconds then all of a sudden the game unfreezes and plays at 10 times speed so we went from frozen to our boat has a rocket in its ass and it goes boo and starts flying across the ocean and it careens into the shore and it goes boom. We're like, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> like, what is this shit? Yeah, it's a fucking piece of shit game. Like, like turbo boat got into the ground, like explosions. Like, what the fuck? So. I was like, okay, so that was hilarious. Him telling that story probably could have been funny and interesting. Had he not talked about putting a rocket in the boat's ass going doo, and then smashing his hands together directly into the microphone. Had he just used his words and described the scene vividly enough that you could actually imagine it, it would have been interesting. But just like everything, DSP had to ruin it because he refused to use his words because he feels so inclined to make some stupid noise or talk about asses and scat all of the time. This is a man who claims that his audience is made entirely of adults 30 to 40 years old and he almost has no children in his audience and he doesn't ever make content for them. But here he is making silly sound effects and crashing his hands together like you would when you tell a preschooler a story. Sound good? Sounds good to me. And by the way, Cat agrees. Also, there's an unlimited supply of sharks. Everywhere you go in the game, there's a shark attacking you constantly. So all you're, you're throwing unlimited spears at sharks trying to kill off Jaws. Like, Jaws is hunting you endlessly in this game. Just get the fuck away from me. It's so stupid. How many fucking sharks could there possibly be in the ocean that want to eat you? It doesn't make any sense. But you know what it is? You need gameplay, and this is the gameplay of the game, so they had to put that in there. Okay? So eventually, you're going to gather enough resources to build your first ship. All right? So you go to St. Anne, you build your first ship. And I, I wish this was an exaggeration. I wish I was making the story up. I promise you this is God's honest true. Cat is going to sail out for the very first time. Her first mission, go destroy two ships. You know, be a pirate. Go destroy two, two like, cargo ships. And then come back with the spoils of, of your sacking of the ships. 
She's going to sail out of the first harbor of the game, St. Anne. It's the starter harbor. And there's two ships, giant ships, sitting in the harbor. She's like, what's that? She sails out. They immediately aggro to her and instantly destroy her boat. What was that? Uh, probably lore accurate is what that is, DSP. I often think when talking about or even just thinking about the concept of pirates, how many pirate ships just got absolutely dunked on by other ships? You know, the ships that were funded and ran by these absolutely massive empires on the other side of the world? So like I said, probably lore accurate is what that was. But it was also a learning experience, if you're willing to take it that way. The game very clearly didn't care what level you were or how new you were to the game. You see these two massive ships, they're gonna dunk on you. Whether or not that was the intention of the game, I don't know. I'll never know. Once again, never going to play the game. But until further notice, until you figure out whether or not that was intentional by the game and they designed it that way on purpose, that's the lesson that you should be walking away with in that instance. The game doesn't care about you. It's going to be difficult. You need to be more careful about which ships you're going near because they can just aggro and absolutely shit on you. But that would require you to actually learn something and hold yourself accountable for your gameplay. Or I guess in this case, Cat's gameplay. Because I want to remind you that DSP is not actually playing the game. This is entirely cat. This is the starter harbor. Why would there be giant enemy ships sitting in the harbor? So in this game, when your sh ship gets destroyed, you have to go back to where your ship was and gather the resources because they drop. If you don't, you lose all your resources. So she respawns and she sails. They're still there. What the fuck is going on? Why are there two ships there? They're not... By the way, this is not human-controlled ships. These are just... NPCs, like like actual computer-controlled enemy ships, sitting there. So she pulls up her spyglass and looks. It, they're level 10 ships. Level 10. She's level 2. She just started the game. Why are there level 10 ships in the starter area? I guess DSP has never played a game where the game didn't dynamically level to you. Apparently never played a game where the world can just do what it wants and you're at its mercy. I mean, I know that that's not true. I know that he's played games that didn't level to his character. He played Morrowind, and if you've ever played Morrowind, you know that very quickly you can start walking into dungeons directly out of Satanine. That will absolutely ruin you. It's not the game's fault that you got wrecked. You were supposed to go into that encounter if you wanted to. That was the freedom that you were given, but you were also given the freedom to get absolutely dicked. You were given the freedom to lose spectacularly. And then you're given the freedom to continue trying or to move on and try later when you're a higher level. I also know that he played Stalker at one point for an October Halloween style marathon. And very quickly in Stalker as well, you could wind up walking somewhere that you weren't supposed to be walking and actually just be murdered by the environment. In fact, it actually happens all of the time. So I don't know how he's confused by this, but of course he is because he's DSP and he memory holes every Every single game that he's ever played it's really a talent so she she tries to sneak by she grabs the cargo she sneaks and now they're chasing her i'm not kidding you i timed it they chased her for five minutes they wouldn't leave her alone they chased her across half the fucking map of the game until finally they broke off their pursuit it didn't make any sense like this is the beginning of the game and this is what they throw at you Of course, any time that DSP says that he actually timed something, I can't believe it. I have to press X to doubt on this one. And he's the one to blame for that because he ruined his credibility when it came to timing things. Remember when he got his grocery bag stolen and he swear to God that he was only gone for two minutes to find the cranberry sauce and he timed it? Yeah, that one was impossible to believe. So I'm not going to believe him any time now that he says that he's ever timed um, anything. Because what really is the likelihood that she started getting chased and he instantly whipped out his phone and was like, Huh, honey, I'm going to time this. Let's see how long they chase you. I don't think it's very high. So finally, you know, she's out of there and she's, she's like, well, I could go destroy the ships, but let me explore. So she did. She drove around for, she drove around. She sailed around for a little bit. She explored. She liked that they were singing sea shanties and stuff, just like they did in Assassin's Creed when she was sailing around. She enjoyed that. Did a little bit of combat here or there. Some loot. Again, the looting is a joke. You go to another town, you can't access the town. All you do, you press a button, you're in a menu. Oh, you want to buy stuff? You're still on your ship. You literally never leave your ship. You just sit on your ship, and you. it's like there's an inventory menu that opens up. You can buy items from a vendor. That's it. There's no town exploration whatsoever in the game.
Another thing that I'm really not all that surprised about, especially because once again, it's a pirate game. Well, yes, exploring the ports and the harbors and all of that would be super interesting and exciting to see. At the end of it all, you were just going to wind up in a shop inventory menu anyway. Why would they go out of their way to model these things, to design these intricate towns that you have to walk around in and make sure that everything is where it needs to be and doing everything that it was needing to do? This is not a defense of the game. This is not me saying that this is how it should be. This is me just telling the SP that this is how the game is going to play because it is a Ubisoft game. They don't particularly care about the end user experience. They've made that very clear. It's been like that for a while now. But time after time, DSP is confused as to why these AAA studios are not putting out games that he deems acceptable. It's because they don't care about you, DSP. It really is that simple. I don't know how you haven't come to this conclusion yet. I don't know how you're still sitting here being confused and upset about it. Okay. She goes and fights a ship and it says, do you want to board the ship and try to take it over rather than destroy it? Sure, she presses the button. There's a meter that blinks. Okay, your guys are on the ship fighting it. Wait, what? Yeah, your guys are on the ship fighting it right now. Well, can I go do that? No, that's not in the game. It's just automatic. It just does it like off camera. And then you'll find out after the fact what happened. You don't actually board the ship and fight it or anything. That doesn't exist. Huh? So literally the entire game, you're just sitting on your ship or you're walking through one town of St. Anne and that's it. At least in the early portion of the game, that's all you can do. Quick time events and button pushes on the ship. That's the whole fucking game. And this is where I'm going to have to agree with DSP because while I can see why you wouldn't include all of these other things that they cut corners on because again, they're Ubisoft. I don't see how you could make a pirate game and not actually allow the player to board the ship. I don't understand how you couldn't actually have boarding style combat. Even if that combat didn't actually include you getting off of the ship and boarding yourself and doing the combat, but instead maintaining a distance where your guys could throw boards across and actually get over there or swing from their ropes. You could see the people people actually battling on top of the ships. That would be interesting. That would be a justifiable way to do it if you didn't actually want to make a third person style combat for shipboarding. Having just a meter for something as important as shipboarding in a pirate game is unjustifiable, regardless of what terrible studio is making the game. So finally, she's coming back to, to St. Anne, all right? And Again, the fucking warships are still guarding the port of St. Anne. So she tries to sneak by again. They destroy her ship instantly again. So she respawns at St. Anne, drives back out, gets her resources, goes back to St. Anne. She goes to talk to an NPC. The NPC, you know, is supposed to do, okay, you destroyed the first two ships. Congratulations. Here's your reward. It gives her her reward and the game just, just stops. Everyone's just awkwardly like, like standing here like this. Huh? The NPC finished their dialogue, but didn't finish the scene. So everyone's just like standing around like this. Huh? What do we do? You press every button, nothing happens. You press start, nothing. No nothing works. You're just frozen. Everyone's just forgot their line. It's like you're in the movie, someone forgot their lines. So everyone just stands around awkwardly. Huh? Huh? Is that what he thinks happens when people forget their lines in a movie? They just stand there and I guess don't progress in making the movie? If that's really what he thinks, I have to wonder how he thinks any movies ever get done. Because I feel like forgetting your lines is one of the most common things to happen on set during a movie or a TV show. But this isn't exactly an unheard of bug when it comes to the world of video games. In fact, it happens quite often actually. Something goes wrong in the scripting behind the scenes and all of a sudden none of the dialogue is playing the way it's supposed to. The NPC aren't moving into position the way they're supposed to. It happens all of the time, especially when you're playing a game one day before it is technically released to the public. Should that be the case? Absolutely not, no, but games are being released constantly unfinished in the modern day and this is what's to be expected. That's why I highly recommend that people don't buy games day one or pre-order and play them early. You really should wait about a week after the game comes out to hear what other people have to say about the game and how it's functioning on a base level, like bugs. But once again, it's just strange for DSP to be so bewildered by a bug that people have experienced multiple times over in a magnitude of games. You'd think that he's new to playing video games. You'd think that he just started in the past couple of years or something. So she closes the game. She reboots the game. It didn't save any of that. So now she would have had to go back from when she destroyed the ships, get past the armada again, get back to the first town and do the whole thing. And she's like, fuck this. And she closed it. And she's like, I'm not playing this ever again. I was like, 
Wow. That's quadruple A game development, according to Eve Gimo. That's their first ever quadruple A game, baby. Wow. That's a lot to offer. Now, basically, here's the deal. All right. It's not that it's awful. It's just not a good game. You can tell this is a game that's not finished. You can tell this is a game that was likely rushed and released because they had to. If you know, if you don't know the story of, Sk of Skull and Bones, this game started development around the same time as Sea of Thieves. And you remember how many years ago Sea of Thieves released? They were announced the same E3. And everyone was like, what's the coincidence that Ubisoft and Microsoft are both making a pirate like online co-op survival game at the same time. It's weird, right? But Sea of Thieves released, flopped, kept selling because it was on, on uh, you know, their on-demand service. I forget, it wasn't called Game Pass back then. It was something else. Um, and then it got a player base and it got a community and then a bunch of fucking trolling and a bunch of toxic shit got associated with that community. But today, it, it's a healthy game. It thrives. It has tie-ins with like Monkey Island and other things. Like it's done well for itself over these years. When did Sea of Thieves ever flop? I feel like I remember the game coming out to a bunch of people playing it all over YouTube, all over streaming sites and having a good time with it. I remember the game coming out and people making memorable moments and memes in the game that got spread around like wildfire. So I have to ask, when did it flop? And then it goes on to talk about all sorts of trolling and negative toxicity that was going on in the game. What is he talking about? I'm not the biggest fan of Sea of Thieves. I've played it a few times, but DSP seems to be the all-knowing expert and everything to do with the game. Is he just talking about how people go out of their way to sink other people's ships to mess with them? Because that's part of the game. That's part of being a pirate. Sometimes you get to dunk on other players. It's part of the fun. This game still didn't come out. It's been 10 years. And see, see Skull and Bones still didn't come out. This game has been started over twice, I believe. It was developed by 10 or more different Ubisoft studios all working different parts of it at remote locations, Okay. And the real reason this game came out, for those who don't know, Ubisoft Singapore. Yes, they have a Singaporean development branch. Shout out Slayer, I guess. Slayer, this is all your fault. You're the one to blame for Skull and Bones. It was you. Made a deal with the Singaporean government. They took a government grant to make this game. So they took government money and said, thank you for the money. We're going to use this to develop our game and make it better because it's going to be a product of Singapore. But then the game kept getting delayed and canceled, delayed and canceled, and Singapore got on their ass and was like, we gave you money. You can't just not release the game that we gave you money to develop. You have to release it or else we're going to basically go to court with you and give you all these fines and penalties for violation of our agreement that you can't just screw the government, you know? So basically, uh, they had to release it. And I, th I really feel like they totally release this game in this condition because they were legally bound to. They didn't have a way out of it or else they were going to get really into big trouble. I really wish that the news about them taking a grant from the Singaporean government had actually never come out. Because anytime that DSP talks about the game, which he has a few times before this segment, this is always his focal point. This is always the thing that he wants to harp on the most. I think it's because he fancies himself some sort of savvy businessman, despite having to file for bankruptcy because he's exactly not that. Or if he just likes to talk about the Singaporean government and the Singapore style division of Ubisoft because they are Asian style. And DSP is always looking for a way to take a jab at some sort of Asian country. But this is the third or even fourth time that he's talked about this on his stream, and I really am just tired of hearing about it. Why can't it just be a game that isn't good? Why does the background have to come into play? There's all sorts of games out there that have troubled development stories, some of them good, some of them bad, but at the end of the day, it should be about the game rather than the development of the game. So you play the game and you're like, it totally feels like it's not finished. Like, they, they rushed it. Yeah, and by the way, remember I was saying, oh, the quick time events to harvest, you know, uh, resources? And I was saying it seems similar to something. Yeah, you want to know what it seems similar like? A mobile game. This whole game, Skull and Bones, feels like you're playing a mobile game the entire time. And I was thinking to myself, this is a mobile game. Everything about it could be played on a phone. There's literally nothing with complex controls. It all could be done touchscreen phone. And I was like, I bet that's what it is. How much do you want to bet this was a mobile game or was being developed as a mobile game? And then at some point they said, let's just make this the real game. And then that's it. This is the game. <laughs> uh, oh my God.
DSP is our resident mobile game expert, so if he says so, I'm gonna have to believe him, unfortunately. This is the one area where he does actually have some sort of expertise. I think it was a very strange decision for him to bring up the fact that it's a mobile game, given his history with mobile games and his active denial of playing them all of the time. But it was his decision to bring it up, so I guess I'm gonna have to believe him. But by far, of all the time, I wish we had a camera rolling when the game froze for 15 seconds, unfroze, and our boat turboed into the shore like it was rocket powered and, and just exploded i wish i had that on camera for you guys that was the most fucking hilarious moment i've seen in ages in any game i was just we were both laughing hilariously at how bad the fucking game is so now here's the thing i've heard a few people saying oh it's not that bad here's the deal it's time to stop giving games a pass because you're playing it with friends and you like it with your friends all right it really is it's time to stop with this nonsense because here's the deal I'm going to name a few games for you guys, okay? Um, Destiny 1 and 2, okay? The Tom Clancy co-op games, which I've forgotten what the name of their Ghost, not Ghost Recon. What are the ones where there's, there's two of them, and you team up with a team of people, and you're, you're co-op online, looter shooter shit? I can't remember what it's called anymore, but there were two of them. You guys are going to remember those, right? Um... You gotta love somebody trying to make a point and then completely not knowing what the hell they're talking about so much so that they can't even remember the name of the game that they're going to shit on. But I mean, this was a preemptive thing. He said that he was gonna name off some games. He named Destiny 1 and 2 and then immediately ran out of games to name off. I guess his mouth just runs faster than that gin-filled brain of his. D this whole industry, there's like, maybe I can name The Division, thank you. The Division 1 and 2 and all of its expansions, correct? And I'm sure you guys, now that I brought up Destiny and The Division, you guys can think of 10 more that are the same exact genre of game. Not to say they're the same gameplay, but it's you team up with your friends, you go online, you endlessly grind and do co-op, and it's a fun experience, okay? Fair enough. There's a place for those games, and there, there's definitely a genre. It's a genre to itself, and it's popular. It makes money. But at one point, when are we going to actually sit down and look at these games together and say... But are these games actually good? Or are they only entertaining because you're having a social experience with your friends as you experience them? And this is where I think that DSP completely goes off the rails and doesn't understand what he's talking about. I think he fundamentally doesn't understand what these games are designed to do and what the core experience of them is. Because the core experience of these games is to play them with friends and have that experience together. There's a reason that so many people can't enjoy these games while playing solo, and it's because they're really not designed around it. So if these games are only fun because you're playing them with your friends and sharing that experience, then that is the genre and they are doing it correctly. Now, I don't think all of these games are fantastic. In fact, they're actually not for me because I don't enjoy that genre too much. But for so many people, getting online and sharing that social interaction with people that they enjoy hanging out with is enough. And the gameplay that those games provide is enough. DSP just doesn't understand that because he doesn't have any friends and he hasn't had any friends for a very long time now. He doesn't know what it's like to have that social interaction and that social experience when playing a game. I challenge you to tell me the story of the Division 1 or 2 is good. Like, wow, I'm so happy I played the Division because that was one of the best stories I've ever seen in gaming, right? Or even or even that the gameplay loop is that good. Or did you enjoy the Division 1 and 2 because you played it with a bunch of friends? And you teamed up and you had camaraderie and it was fun. You were joking with each other when you played it right and there he goes immediately to tell me that the division story was fantastic and the best thing you ever played like no that wasn't the case but i don't think that it was exactly striving for that either i don't know why he's so obsessed with graphics and narrative as if that is the end all be all to gameplay when again if you ask me those are the two least important things when it comes to playing a video game and again that's okay but there's a problem with that you got these inferior games they don't play well and a lot of these games launch awful and then over a year or two get improved because now the game's out there, people bought it. <clears throat> so now you've got post-release support that makes these games better or maybe even eventually what they were intended to be at launch, but they rushed the game out, right? But we have to stop as consumers accepting that games come out unfinished.
100%, I agree with you, DSP, but I'm not the consumer like you are. You're the person who was pre-ordering the same Call of Duty games year after year and complaining that they're not good. You're the person that bought the special edition to Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth and didn't even like one of the core game modes of Dondoko Island. You're the one who was giving all of these companies all of your money as fast as possible. I'm the person telling people to wait a week and see how the game actually turned out via word of mouth. Me! Re. It's just ironic hearing it come from you, the biggest consumer of them all. Skull and Bones is not even a half-finished game. All you have to do is play it for 20 minutes and you're going to realize that. You're like, what is this shit? Like, there's no story. There's no actual gameplay in any town besides the starter town. You can't fight hand-to-hand. -hand. You can't board enemy ships besides a meter. You can't harvest things besides a quick time event. Like, where's the gameplay? The gameplay loop is like playing a mobile game on your phone. So why did you buy a console game? It doesn't make sense. Well, DSP, if it's as much of a mobile game as you say it is, I'm honestly surprised that you're not enjoying it. That you're talking about it as poorly as you are. Because again, you are the mobile game king. You're the guy who knows his stuff. And the problem is, if we accept games like this, and we say, oh, it's fun to play with friends, fine, but is it a good game? I don't care if you had fun fucking around with your friends. Because the truth is, right now, you go to the movie theater, and you can see the worst movie you've ever seen, but you're joking with your friends, and it's a great time. Does that mean the movie's good and people should go watch it? No. It means you made fun of it so bad that it was a good time. That doesn't mean the movie was good. So it's the same thing with games. Just because you made fun of the game and you fucked around and had a social experience with your friends doesn't mean the game was good. It just means you found a way to make the best of the situation, right? <clears throat> And I think that he's conflating quality and value because a piece of media does not actually have to be good quality wise for it to have some sort of value. He gave the example of a bad movie that you have fun making fun of with your friends. If you had that experience and it provided some sort of enjoyment to you, that movie had a value to you. Whether or not that value is exactly high is up to you, but that doesn't make it a worthless movie. It actually gives it some sort of credit and it gives it a reason to exist. It may not be the intended reason, but it is is a reason nonetheless and that's the role that some of these games fulfill for people and while i can agree with dsp to some extent that people are putting too high a value on these style of games putting too high a value and giving away too much money for this experience as simple as it is i'm not exactly writing it off as something that shouldn't exist it's not that these games just should not happen anymore it's that they should be polished higher and people should hold these studios to a higher expectation and when i say hold them to a higher expectation i mean that they should ask for the game to be functional they should ask for the bugs to not be nearly as prevalent as they are where dsp seems to be insisting that there should be completely new gameplay mechanics and in-depth narrative driven story and a myriad of other features so you have to stop this shit because if we keep rewarding games like this oh well it was fun because i played it with my friends i don't care i don't care what you did with your friends was the game good compare it to other games that are out for the same price point of 70 dollars they are charging 70 dollars for skull and bone this isn't even a 20 dollar game at this point i wouldn't pay 20 dollars cat played eight paid 18 dollars for ubisoft plus played it for two hours she says i got ripped off i got completely ripped off this is not a game i agree after doing it for two hours that was a joke that wasn't even close to a full game experience no one should pay for that at all <clears throat> yet now we're supposed to forgive this Oh, $70. Oh, it's fine because I played it with my friends and we had a good time. Fuck you and your friends. I don't care about what you did. And this is where it just seems like he's seething at the fact that he doesn't have any friends to experience games with. He just doesn't understand the value that friends can bring to an experience, and he's not willing to accept that some games are better off with people. He just seems so upset at the mere idea that playing with people can be a positive experience. You could also go play basketball with your friends and have a good time. That has nothing to do with the quality of the game. The game's terrible. So why are you saying that it's a passable experience when it's not, right? <laughs> it's, I hate people who want to rationalize and justify shit like that. Sorry, my experience with Destiny, it never was good. It's not terrible, but it's nowhere near as good as a Halo experience. It's nowhere near as good as any real MMO. It's just a shooter that got tons of budget to advertise. 
So they always said it was the best one and it wasn't. It's boring as dirt. And I'm not exactly a Destiny stan, but DSP is someone who is saying this and has never done any of the raids, has never experienced that cooperation that is required between a group of friends to get a challenge done like that. He doesn't understand that feelings that go along with going through this challenge with your friends and coming out the other side the victor. He doesn't understand the excitement that comes with that because he's never done it because he doesn't have anybody to play with. He's also made it very clear that he is not interested in grinding in video games, that that's not something that he actually enjoys doing. So of course, Destiny is not going to be for him. Of course, any MMO is not going to be up his alley. But for him to write off the entire genre simply because he finds it boring and it's not something that he enjoys is so strange to me. It cannot be your cup of tea, but also have some sort of value to somebody. There's tons of game genres that I don't like, that I personally don't enjoy and don't honestly see why someone would enjoy it. But I'm not going to sit here and shit on all of these other game genres simply because I don't like them and I don't find them interesting. It's disrespectful, it's uncalled for, and it's just rude. It's a fucking boring ass gameplay loop and it never deserved an iota of the attention or popularity it got. People just fell in line that, oh, this is the good co-op game. I must play it. I must play it. It's just not that good. The Division is a joke. I played it, if you remember, I played it um as when it was free for like a week after E3 or something like that. I was like, I don't get it. Like, I mean, I, okay, you play with friends, but it's just there's nothing special to this. There's nothing unique. Well, Fallout 76. Do you remember that debacle? How bad it released? And then I actually played it during E3 week the year after, when again, when it was free. And the game, I have a teammate who can't get off his knees. He's sliding around on the game endlessly on his knees like this. Wee! Like he's on treads. Like he's on a tank. Woohoo! And he's like, dude, this game's been out for like four or five months. Why is the game still so glitched? You scoot around on your knees. Like, what the fuck is this junk? Oh, but it's a good game because you play it with your friends. No, it's not. It's junk. Again, if you're having a fun time playing with your friends, if you're having a positive experience after you get off work and it helps you unwind, the game has value. There's a reason for it to exist. Maybe not at the price point that it exists at currently, but it has a reason to exist. It has a place in your library so that you can do exactly that. Have fun and unwind at the end of the day. But the only time that DSP is willing to unwind is when he's playing WWE Champions and pulling his credit card out to send Scopely more infinite money. Stop buying rewarding junk if you keep buying and rewarding people with awful games like this the whole industry will be this games as a service trash everything will be a, a click a fucking mini game tap the buttons bullshit all the games you buy will be trash you have to stop i don't care that co-op is fun demand better demand that the co-op game is better not that oh we had fun because we fucked around in it yeah you could also fuck around in real life or in any other game and have a better experience i don't want to hear it Stop spending money on this trash. I just recommend not taking financial advice from somebody who not only had to file for bankruptcy, but also foreclose on a condo on the other side of the country. Simply because he'd rather spend money on statues that he didn't need and drink himself to death while pulling Hogan's. I'm not exactly a financial counselor either, but I can tell you from here that that's not a good idea. Do not take advice from this guy. Stop rewarding idiots. Eve Gimmo, right now, actually thinks he has a quad A game. Fuck him. Fuck his company and make him suffer. Don't buy this piece of shit. And then actually he won't be rewarded for idiocy. But the problem is you keep rewarding the idiocy by buying these terrible games. Do not buy Skull and Bones under any circumstances. Do not buy it. Do not play it. Do not watch someone play it. Do not get Ubisoft Plus. Do not even click on a picture of it. Do not even look at the art online. Don't watch a video of it. Don't do nothing. Stop wasting time on this shit. Because if you exist, if it actually doesn't exist, it won't recoup its cost, and then they'll fucking stop with this bullshit, and they'll make good games again. But we have to stop entertaining garbage. <clears throat> okay. So. <laughs> that was our day off, all right? So once again, DSP is making up the opinion for his dents. He's decided that they should not be interacting with this game in any facet. Because he said the game is bad and they shouldn't play it, of course the game is bad and they shouldn't be playing it. Of course, if you apply that same logic to DSP where I tell you that he's the scum of the earth and a piece of shit, you shouldn't watch his content. All of a sudden, I'm the bad guy and he wants you to go check out his content and make up the decision for yourself. I guess there's a reason they call him DSP Cold Leader. But that's gonna do it for today's video. Of course, another big ups to Snort Hogan for the clip in this one. 
everyone. As always, I appreciate it, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Shout out to everybody who watched the video, especially if you made it this far. A special big ups to all of my members. I really appreciate all of you. Thank you so much. Hopefully, I'll catch all of you guys in the next video. But until then, make sure that you check out other detractor content and dive deeper into that. Snortex. Ah!